Okay, so what we started talking about last class was this idea of algorithms um, versus, versus idea of algorithms versus heuristics. An algorithm is a procedure that solves a well-defined problem. Okay, provably all the time gives you the right answer. A heuristic is a rule of thumb, um, ad hoc, but maybe does a good job usually solution to a problem that's either well defined or messy. And again, in biology, we often have to deal with two diff both of these kinds of things. We, as computer scientists, want well defined, beautiful algorithms. Sometimes the problems don't let us do that. Okay, and that's life, but that's what we've got to deal with. So I gave the example last time of a, uh, you know, the exact pattern matching problem, where uh, I give you a text string and a pattern string, and I ask you to find where does that pattern string exactly lurk as a substring in the text. Okay, so uh, oops, actually, do I have a pen? Looks like I may have lost my... No, um, do I get a pen anymore? Yes. Okay, so uh, just to remind ourselves, we have a text string. That would be T was our text string. We have a pattern string P. That would be a typically short string. Okay, and the question is, is there any place in the text string where the pattern string occurred? Any questions about that? Especially from the non-CS people. Any questions? So last time we proposed an algorithm where, uh, let me see if I can get going here. Last time we proposed an algorithm where uh, basically we tested every possible position in the text and then saw whether or not a pattern matched there. So just to again review, we said basically if this was my text, Okay, I took my pattern, I tried to align it at the first spot in the text, and then said match, 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 until there was a character mismatch, at which point I knew the pattern couldn't fit in the first position. Then I slid my pattern over by one, and I did the same thing, match, 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 until there was a mismatch. And if eventually the pattern existed in the text, there would be a place where I slid it, where every character matched from then on. Okay? Any questions? That's basically what this algorithm is saying. If anyone wants me to explain what that algorithm is saying, please let me know. I'd like to, I don't want to leave my non-CS people behind. Yes? Should you go through the counters, please? The N okay, so what are the counters that I'm saying? I'm having two nested loops. Okay, the question, question is, what about the counters? I is going to refer to my position in the pattern. Okay? So uh, there, I is going to start from 1 and go to dot, 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 to basically the end of the string. Or if my text is of length m, the end of the string minus m, because if I get too close to the end of the string where the pattern would stick off the end, it obviously can't fit there, right? So the outer counter tries for all possible starting positions. The inner counter is going to be going about all possible uh, positions in the pattern offset from that spot, right? Does everybody see that? And it goes down basically J starts at 1, and it basically says test the I jth character of the pattern against the i plus jth character of the text. So long as they match, everything is increment, go to the next character in the pattern. And everything is fine until either there is a character mismatch, which would be there, or a, um, we have run off the end of the pattern. If we run off the end of the pattern, that means that we matched. If we know, if we run off the end of the pattern, if we run off the end of the pattern, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. then we have found the pattern. If we run off the end of the text, that would be a problem. We can't run off the end of the text because we're not starting close enough to the end of the text, right? If you're asking me to take ten steps forward, I am not going to do it nine steps from the start of a ledge off the top end of the building, right? 
That's basically what I'm saying here. Okay? Any questions about that? Any questions about the algorithm? Are we basically in control here? Okay? So what is the... Let's try this. The risk of playing. Okay, hold on. Um, let's just try this thing. Uh, okay, trouble. What is that thing? I don't know what this is doing. Let's say this thing. Okay, good. So how much time does this algorithm take? This is where the analysis comes in. Because computer scientists, when they're given an algorithm like this, we agree this was a correct algorithm for solving the, uh, what do you call it? For solving the string matching problem. How do we know it was correct? Well, if the pattern existed in the text, it had to exist someplace. That would mean there had to be a starting place where it would exist, some i that would be the starting point. If so, we're explicitly checking all the m characters after that to make sure that they match. So clearly this is a correct algorithm. If there is a pattern, we will find it. Any questions about that? The bigger question is how efficient is it? That's what I would like to say is the, the, the bigger question. Let's try this. Boom. Boom. So how many steps will this algorithm take? And I want to argue is, to some extent, it depends upon the length, what the contents of the strings are. OK? If the text was all A's, OK, and the pattern was all B's, how many steps would it take for this algorithm to stop? First of all, is the pattern in the text? No, everybody agrees with that, right? How many comparisons or steps would it take to rule that out? Yes. N. N. Well, N is the length of the string. The answer is oh, yes. N minus, N, minus N minus M. To me, I would say N is a good enough answer. N is bigger than M. OK? So this is actually going to be getting into what we mean by the big O notation a little bit. OK? But what are we really saying? You're saying it's basically n minus m comparisons. And you're right, OK? Why is it? We compare the first character against the first thing, and eh, it gets rejected. Slide the pattern over, and eh, it gets rejected. It's going to get rejected on the first character each time. That's something like n minus m steps, OK? Any questions about that? That is the fastest you can get through this algorithm. What is the slowest you could get through this algorithm? OK, yeah. n times m comes steps, OK? Suppose, let's say, we weren't so lucky. Suppose my text consisted of all a's again, and my pattern consisted of all n minus m minus 1 a's followed by a b. What's going to happen on my alignment? OK? It's going to say, it's going to start testing. Good, 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 good uh, on the last letter. That's M comparisons, and it failed. Then I slide over by one letter in the text. OK? Good, 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 uh, fails at the end of M. Does everybody see that? Yes? Wouldn't it be <coughs> N minus M times M? So it would really be N minus M times M times m steps. That would be the right number if I was exactly counting. OK? Now, which of these actually is, what, how much is it in practice? OK? In the best case, this algorithm is extremely fast, OK, linear in the size of the input. In the output, it's the product of the sizes of the two strings. That's what we would mean by quadratic, OK? Because it's a product of two things, OK? Which of these is what, what happens in practice? Somewhere in between. Somewhere in between? I think the answer would be is, I don't know. It depends what you mean by practice, OK? If you live in a world where um, you know, people are giving you softball questions, OK? Then they're probably doing the first world. Exact, practice is a question of what data you're given, in, you're given, right? And it's hard to say what data you're being given in your application. 
Because first of all, I don't know anything about your application, right? And second, you probably don't know that much about what the real context of what you're doing is, okay? So in general, we don't like to talk about, uh, when we talk about analyzing algorithms, we are for the most part not going to worry about what happens in practice, okay? Because it turns out to be hard to analyze. It depends upon what kind of strings you're being given. And that's usually something we really don't know, okay? Instead, the way computer scientists analyze algorithms is using what we will call worst case. We'll usually just say that the time that it takes in the worst case is what we really care about. So this would be an algorithm that computer scientists would call an n times m algorithm, a quadratic time algorithm, okay? And that's basically what we would say it is in the worst case. Any questions? Any questions of why we're doing this? Okay, some people find it perverse that we're always thinking about the worst case. The reason we do it this way is two reasons. One is, like I say, in general, you can't tell me what's going on in practice, okay? The other is that if we are clever enough and we focus on the worst case, we can often do better. So for this very same problem of string matching, there is an algorithm that runs in linear time in the worst case. It's a more complicated algorithm. It's a much more clever algorithm. And by focusing on the worst case, we are motivated to try to design algorithms that are good in the worst case. If it's good in the worst case, it's good in every case. Okay? And that's why we think this way. Yes? Isn't that not necessarily true? What's not necessarily true? good in the worst case, it's good in every case? Well, if the worst case is good enough, then every case is good enough. That much I believe, right? If you have a, a list of all possible outcomes and the worst outcome isn't that bad, you can say, I'm, I'm happy with what's going to happen, right? And that's why if we can make the worst, if we can prove, come up with an algorithm where the worst case is still is good, then you're always happy, okay? And that's, I guess, the way that we think about these things. Any questions about this, especially from our non-CS people? Because I want to make sure you're comfortable with this idea of how we're going to be thinking about algorithms. Any questions? Okay. Any questions? Okay. The other thing to note when we talk about algorithms is that for some generalizations of problems become easy and some of them without changing the problem very much. Suppose I want let's say, all occurrences of the pattern, okay, as opposed to stopping on the first occurrence. That problem doesn't look too much different than right now. What, which is the version I gave you? Did it stop on one occurrence or did it find all occurrences? Found one. Suppose I told you I want an algorithm to find all occurrences. Would it have been difficult to change my algorithm to do that? Okay, I think the answer is no. I think it's trivial, right? It just uh, basically pop the test in the loop, right? And then just keep going, try another I afterwards. So certain generalizations don't change the worst case efficiency. Certain general generalizations do, like matching where you are allowed errors. Let's say trying to find the best place where it matches, where you allow spelling errors or other changes. And so the part of the act of an algorithm designer if you design an algorithm, you see how far you can generalize it. Where does it become a different problem? Any questions about that? Okay. That is an algorithm. That's why we'll talk a lot in here about string matching algorithms. Any questions? Okay, good. Um, good. So when we talk about string matching algorithms, we will use uh, the speed or all these algorithms. When we talk about the efficiency of algorithms, we will be using something called the big O notation to get around some problems. Uh, this is a convenient way of talking how fast or slow algorithms are. As has been pointed out so far, the algorithm that we talked about really ran in, what was it, n minus m times m time. Okay? If m is not too big, 
this thing is sort of just noise to talk about. That's, I guess, one way to think about it. So the way that we talk about the speed of an algorithm is we talk about the biggest term in the number of steps, OK? And ignore constants and ignore little things about it. That's what we mean by the big O notation. So when I talk about how fast that string algorithm is, I usually will say it is big O of n t m times n, OK? Meaning it's on the order of n times m, OK? Any questions about that? OK? I encourage you to look at the, if you're a non-CS person, and this is, sounds frightening, look at the ch introductory chapter in the bioinformatics book. They will talk in there a little bit about the big O notation and why we count things like that. So don't be, sur don't be afraid if you hear me say that an algorithm is quadratic. That means it's n times m. You may hear me talk about an algorithm that is linear. That would be n plus m. That would mean that the, if it's linear, that means the number of steps you're taking is proportional to the size of the input. Here, it's proportional to the square of the size of the input. OK? And the difference is, has to do with how big problems we can end up solving. OK? If you have an algorithm that is linear, OK, it is almost fast enough essentially to work on any application for any big size of problem. When we talk about an algorithm that is quadratic, usually the input can't be too large before you have trouble. I mentally think that a computer can do about a million things in before it's, it bothers, it's, it's worth talking about time, OK? A loop that runs, how, how, how many million things does your computer do a second? Maybe a thousand million things, or who knows what. It depends what a thing is, right? But to a computer, a million is, to my mind, the distinction between too small to count and starting to be a, a reasonable amount of time. So if you're doing so, an algorithm that is quadratic, a thousand squared is a million. That's a sign that any algorithm that is n squared is going to start to become a significant amount of time around the time n is 1,000. OK? So if you have a problem on 1,000, strings of length 1,000, then an n squared algorithm is good. If you have strings of length a million, n squared is no longer good. A million squared is a big number. OK? And so linear algorithms are fast enough to run on anything. Quadratic, you can do for small problems, for medium-sized problems. OK? But at some point, a quadratic algorithm won't be good enough. Any questions? OK? Any questions? Let me come back. Boom. Then there are algorithms we're going to see that are even worse than quadratic. Quite often, we'll see problems in here where the best algorithms known are exponential. They run in 2 to the n, maybe trying all possible subsets of n things. Or n factorial, trying all possible arrangements of things. And the trouble is, since 2 to the 20 is a million, or 10 factorial is a million. You can only hope to use these algorithms on problems where you've got 20 input items or 10 input items before you start having a problem. OK? Any questions about that? So there's this world we live in where, depending upon your algorithm's complexity, really what a complexity governs is how big an input can you deal with while you're willing to sit and wait. Any questions? OK. Any questions, especially for my non-biology people here? So we keep score by worst case complexity. We want to lower the worst case complexity as far as we can. And if we get at the point where it stops, it tells us basically how big an input we can deal with. Any questions? OK. 
So that said, let's talk about one of the famous big ideas in computer science. So in computer science, there are not that many big ideas, okay? There's one of them, though, is um, a concept called NP-completeness, okay? And this is an idea that certain problems don't have fast algorithms, okay? Suppose I give you the job of solving a, pro a, a problem. I give one of you the pro uh, I said, oh, I have a problem here. Give me a fast algorithm. If you come back and say, I can't do it, that means one of two things, okay? It could mean that the guy who did it wasn't smart enough, okay? And that it, there really was a fast algorithm and they couldn't find it. Or maybe it means that there isn't a fast way to do it. And what's an amazing thing is that um, one of the really big ideas in computer science is that many problems, there is in fact no way to solve it efficiently. Okay? But even more amazing, there is a way to tell that you can't solve it efficiently. This is a big idea. So this I want to make sure. And in fact, I suspect many of the CS people don't understand this as well as they would like. So here's where I'd like to see some questions. So now the idea of NP-completeness, when we say that a problem is NP-complete, what we mean is that there is provably no fast algorithm for it. There is no linear time algorithm. There is no quadratic algorithm for it. There is no cubic algorithm for it. There is nothing but an exponential time algorithm for it. And it's not a question of people being too dumb. It's a question of the problem simply can't let you do it. Okay? Any questions about that? Now, the amazing thing is it's hard to prove a negative, right? How do I prove that there's not, a, not pink unicorns out there? Well, you can say, well, I look hard to find a pink uniform. I couldn't find one. They'll say, oh, yeah, but you didn't check this guy's closet. How do you know there's not a pink unicorn there? The interesting thing is that there, that there is a way to prove that there is no fast algorithm for something. And that's really this big idea of NP-completeness, okay? Any questions? So when you hear me, yeah, question. This is given uh, the assumption that NP is This is given certain technical assumptions, which are, uh, you know, th th it's given an assumption that uh, something because saying P is not equal to NP. This is assumed by, you know, um, th for those of you who don't know about it, uh, well, there's a, there is a, this is saying that there is no such algorithm is true up to a certain technical assumption that everybody in the world believes. Okay? So when I tell you something NP complete means no algorithm exists, that's the level that I want you to believe in it. Okay? If a problem is no, I say a problem is NP complete, it means that there is no way of solving it faster than polynomial in the worst case. Any questions about that? Okay? Some of you may have well heard over the summer about this guy who claimed to prove that P is not equal to NP. Okay? So, again, the statement that I'm making is true up to a technical thing that is, you know, still a big open question in mathematics, although everybody thinks they know how it's going to go. There was a rumor over the summer of somebody who claimed, was somebody over the summer who claimed, hey, I can prove that this thing is in fact really true that this technical weaseling that I'm trying to make here doesn't have to be made, that these problems really, really are hard with no weaseling. Um, the proof basically seems to have broken down and evaporated, so don't worry about that. But, um, but from our point of view, what it means is NP completeness provides a way to show that a problem is hard, okay? That there is no fast way to do it, okay? And this is an amazing thing, because it means being able to show that there isn't a closet of where the pink unicorn can be lying on. Okay? I can say there is no pink unicorn. There is no fast algorithm for this problem. Any questions? Okay? I'll try to explain a little bit more about um, how this is done later. Okay? So I may actually, I'll try to show you a little NP completeness proof. So maybe you'll get some insight into it. But for now, I want just the big picture to be seen. Yes?
So there are some, the question is, are there problems? So basically, there are a lot of problems for which there are efficient algorithms, okay? And these we feel good about, okay? Because we can solve them. There are a bunch of problems that we can prove are NP-complete, meaning that neither I, that, that no one can solve them, okay? It's not, you know, no matter how smart you are, okay? And there are a few problems in the world that someone doesn't quite know the answer about, okay? Which, which way they fall. The interesting thing is actually how few of those problems there actually are. That using the basic tools from algorithms, you can al almost always take, if you're a good algorithms person, you can take a problem and with a couple of days thought, either find a fast algorithm or prove that it's hard, almost all the time. There's a few problems people are still in limbo. But the tools of algorithms are well enough developed that you can either say, you come to me a problem, I'll say, uh, let me think about it. Ah, here's a polynomial algorithm. Or you come away and I'll say, hey, I can't find the fast algorithm. I could then prove, oh, yes, this problem, in fact, is NP-complete, and there is no fast algorithm. The tools are usually pretty, pretty good. Any questions? Any other questions about this distinction? So when I say a problem is NP-complete, it means I have proven there is no fast algorithms for it. I remember once I went to a computational biology conference where all the algorithms people were getting up one by after another, saying, here's a famous problem in biology. Here I'm going to prove it's NP-complete, and you can't solve it. And they did this for several lectures. And then the biologists started booing every time um, a computer scientist went up and said that the problem was NP-complete. Because in some sense, what they're saying is, here's a problem we care about. The computer scientist is saying, we can't do anything about it. Go away. OK? But proving things NP complete is a very useful thing, because it sort of shows that, um, that heuristics are now the right way to go. Again, computer scientists think about well-defined algorithms for solving problems. If the problem is NP complete, we shouldn't be thinking like that anymore. And it sort of provides the moral justification to start thinking about heuristic methods and things like that. Because we know we're not just being too stupid. We know that the problem really is too hard to do any other way. Any questions about that? Any questions about how we think? OK. Fair enough. OK. Um, I'll say this again a little bit later if I am in the mood. But basically, how do, the, how do we prove that the purple unicorn doesn't exist? OK. Well, we basically show that your problem is as hard as some other problem that we know is hard. So there is one famous problem, a few famous problems, which for a variety of reasons, computer scientists have said, this problem is hard, can't be solved. They work very hard to show this. But once they have shown that these problems are hard, if you can show that your problem is as hard as one of these, then your problem is also hard. And so basically, the way that I will show, some biologist will walk into my office. They'll say, I have this problem. What I will do is convert their problem into one of these other hard problems and show that if I could solve the biologist's problem, I could solve one of these famous hard problems. And since you can't solve the famous hard problem, you can't solve the biologist's problem. That's basically how that goes. This is reasoning I don't expect people to necessarily get the first time you see it. But it's just to know that there's not magic going on. Any questions? Any questions about that? Yes? These hard, famous hard problems, are they hard in the sense that they take a lot of time? They're hard in that there is provably no good algorithm for it that will not take an exponential amount of time. OK? Yes? It, it's provable modulo some weasel words, OK? The weasel words are not so interesting. To me, they're not really weasel words, OK? They're, you know, they're, they're a pretty mild assumption about how the world works, OK? That hasn't been formally proven. That's why I have to issue certain weasel words, right? Think of that as fine print in a contract. But in the contract, in the big print, the part that matters, OK? Basically, these problems have been proven to be hard. 
Okay? And so therefore, if I show that your problem is as hard as one of these, then your problem is hard. That's really what I'd like to say. Any questions about that? Yes? Well, that's part of the weasel, again, the weasel wordness. I'm still telling you these problems are hard, okay? Sort of, so if, if, if you could, I'm saying you can't solve any of these for the purposes of making this clear and simple. You're saying, what if I can solve them? Well, now you're talking fantasy land, okay? <laughs> and all kinds of different things happen in fantasy land, okay? So my question was, how are they related in the sense if you solve one, you can solve all these the same? Okay, so the fantasy land idea here is that by basically, again, I don't want to make this a complexity theory class, but the basic idea here is that I can show you that um, the reason I know that satisfiability is hard is that somebody showed that if you could solve satisfiability, you could solve anything else, okay? That's in a large class of problems. By doing this, 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 this complicated reduction, they call it Cook's theorem. Okay? And so basically he simulated a Turing machine, which is a model of computing, a computer, and showed that if you could solve satisfiability, you could simulate a Turing machine. Okay? Over all efficient algorithms. Okay? And that's considered to be an amazing thing and you can't do it. Okay? So that's why there is this property that if you suddenly found you could solve this fast, you could solve anything else that can be done by a Turing machine in a polynomial amount of time. Okay? And that's, that, that's sort of where this magical reduction property comes in. But take a, take a you know, read, read something about the, the foundations of NP completeness. I don't want to get into this to too much technical detail. There's some technical detail to really understand it. But to look at this with awe and ad admiration is not that detailed. It says that certain problems are hard. There's no fast way to do it. If you can show that your problem is as hard as one of these, there's no way to do it. Okay? And that's a better guarantee than anything that I have fine print off for. Okay? Any questions? Any questions about this? Okay? We're going to try to make this a little more concrete, actually, in a little bit, but I want to make sure people understand the big picture of what we're doing. So NP complete, when I say it, it's a, hard, it's a fancy word for saying you can't solve it efficiently. Any questions? Okay. So let's look at a problem that is a, a very important string problem that we're going to spend actually a lot of time on the first third of the semester here. Okay. A problem called shortest common substring. Okay. It is a... Um, problem that says basically, like any algorithm problem, there is an input and an output. The input is a small a set of text strings, M of them, written over some alphabet. The desired output is the shortest string that contains each one of these as a substring. So my input is essentially a set of patterns, if you wish. And I want to know what is the shortest string such that each one of these is a substring for it, would, would, would come up on that pattern matching algorithm that I had before. Okay? So, if I ask for a string that will contain the patterns, can someone give me an algorithm to take a collection of strings and find a string that contains every one of them as a substring? How might you do that? Just concatenate all of them. Does everybody see that? So, for example, my input was ABBA, BABA, BUBBA. If I give you the string A, B, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, B, A, A, does everybody agree that all three of these are substrings of it? How many people agree with that? Okay? Do you see what I mean by a substring? Especially the non-CS people. Any questions? I'd like to say I don't see that. Okay? So if I ask you find a substring, a, sup a string that contains all the patterns, that is easy. 
Just concatenate them together, right? Suppose I want the shortest string, though, that concat contains them. What is the shortest string anybody can find that contains Abba, Baba, and Bubba? Okay, does anyone want to make a proposal for what the shortest string is? Yes, what's yours? Like eight characters long. Um, what do you want to propose? I wrote it down. I don't remember where. Sorry. Okay. Okay, somebody else have a candidate? Who actually has a string in front of them? Yes, you. B, B, A, A. So far, you're right, someplace. Okay, I know this is going to be someplace. Here. What? Are you you want to continue or no? From the very beginning. Wait, wait, so. so Okay, at this point, we're going to say uh, wrong answer. And somebody else now give me a string. Yes? Tell me what it is. B. Okay, so if that's Baba, Baba, this is saying I have one. It does have eight characters. Does it have Baba? I see Baba. Does it have Baba? I see Baba. Does it have Abba? I see Abba. Does everybody agree? This is a string of eight letters now that contains all of those strings. Is there a string of length seven that contains all of these strings? You say no. I heard someone say no. Why not? Okay. Sort of a weasel, you're sort of well, you're saying, saying, okay, you don't think so. It's basically what you're saying. I didn't hear a crisp proof. Okay, does anybody have a crisp proof? I don't have one in mind, so I'm not not saying I'm any better. Any uh, any arguments that we say you can't do better than that? What? Well, excuse me. A, B, B, yeah, they have to be like that, right. So how can we determine? Well, so can we come up with a lower bound? I would say that for three strings of length four, it seems clear to me you can't do better than six. Why would I come up with that answer? I would say that there's got to be the, if you start out with the first four, and that was one of your strings, right? The best you could have possible for the next one would be to have the next pattern show up with one character extension, right? That's your best dream that you could have, right? And then since you need three of them. So the best possible thing you could hope for is of length six. So we know that the length of the superstring has got to be greater than or equal to six and less than or equal to eight, right? And we would probably need to have some kind of an argument you can't do better. Does anybody think they have a quick argument you can't do better than that? Okay. One possibility might be to try all possible strings of that size. Okay, and say, oh, look, there's no string of length 7 that will do it. Okay. Or maybe by doing some kind of ad hoc reasoning on this. Okay, I can kind of believe that there probably isn't one. Okay, but we haven't really at this point proven it, other than to say, well, all of you have tried and you failed. Okay, any questions about that? So the shortest common superstring problem is to give as input, take as input, a set of strings, and as output return the shortest string possible. Okay, that contains all of them. Any questions about what the problem is? Okay, now I ask you, can anybody give me an algorithm to find the shortest common superstring of a set of words? Okay, can anyone give me an out, suggest an algorithm to find this, given this? Oh, 
Okay, so I'm hearing something about uh, decompose these into smaller pieces. Well, how small a piece do you want to make it? How do you decide where to break it? ABB. Okay, what you might be saying, okay, not, I, I may have gotten that, but let's see what else we've got. Here, build a suffix tree and do what with it? We haven't talked about suffix. Okay, I have no idea what that means. Okay? Any other ideas? Okay, yes? So, uh, versus two, two strings. Yeah. And merge it. Okay. And so, this is the idea that I think I'm, you know, is it one. so what you're saying is find the two strings, perhaps that overlap the most, and merge them. Does this kind of make sense? So, here we would say, how did this work? Well, the claim was that uh, ABBA, that if we overlapped ABBA and Bubba, we got a string of length 5 that contained ABBA and Bubba. Is that right? And that's as most possible. Maybe we should merge them. So what you're actually proposing as an algorithm is, uh, let's try next something that we would call the greedy heuristic. Okay? Your algorithm is take two strings, find which of the two input strings have the longest overlap, and then merge them. Does everybody get that idea? Especially my biologists or my non-CS people. Any questions about what the strategy is? Take a look at all pairs of strings, find which two overlap the most, perhaps by brute force trial, and merge them, okay? That seems to me to be the obvious way to do it. There's one problem with that, is that there's no guarantee that what you're going to do is right, okay? Let's take a look at this particular input. Here I've got three input strings. B, A, 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 B, right? Beginning and end with a B, A, B. Ab, 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 ending with a C, and a double A here, starting again with my bub, 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 bubs. Okay? Does everybody see that if I have these three strings of length N, okay, I can basically compress them like this, essentially down to pretty much the length of one string plus the small tail. Okay? Does everybody see that kind of thing? If I had these strings were a billion repeats, the length of my string would basically be the billion repeats, which would be in common, plus a couple characters at the beginning, plus a couple characters at the end. Okay? If I did this overlapping. But what would the greedy heuristic have done? The greedy heuristic on this one noticed that if I merge the AAB string with the one that ends with the C, they can overlap with ex missing only one character shift, right? This is the best I can hope to overlap two strings, right? So the greedy would say, hey, that's a good place to merge, right? And once you've merged it, though, you're trapped, okay? Because on this end, I've got my two A's. On this end, I've got my C. I've got left the big baba, baba, baba. But no matter where I overlap it, I can't put it here because the C doesn't exist in here. And I can't put it here because the AA doesn't exist in there. Does everybody see that? You made what was locally a good move by compressing these two. But in the grand scheme of things, this there was a much, much shorter answer. Okay? In fact, if you do this on these kind of strings, in general, your answer will be almost twice as long as possible. How many people sort of see that? See that the greedy did a bad thing? Any questions about that? 
Okay? This is very instructive for a couple of reasons. One is it illustrates what we mean by a heuristic versus an algorithm. Right? The rule of find the two that merge the best, okay, is a good thing to try to do, okay, in general. The only catch with that is, in general, sometimes it will be bad, okay? Does everybody see that? Usually, in practice, maybe, maybe from my inputs, it's not a bad thing to do, but merging the, the, the greedy way, Merge the two with the longest overlap, it is a heuristic because it doesn't guarantee us the best possible answer. Any questions? Any questions about what this, what this is, why it's a heuristic? Okay? Now, the fact that it's a heuristic would seem like we should hold our head in shame about it, except for one problem. It turns out the problem of finding the shortest common superstring is NP-complete, okay? If any of you claim that you did find an algorithm which was efficient, that always came up with the shortest possible superstring, I would know your algorithm was wrong. Why? You would be saying there's a fast algorithm for an NP-complete problem? I would say there is no such thing as a fast algorithm for an NP-complete problem. Therefore, your algorithm is wrong. Okay, without even looking at it. Okay? So interestingly, the shortest common superstring problem, I don't think I'm going to go into this, is an NP complete problem. Okay? Meaning there is no fast algorithm for it. So in fact, the fact that there is a heuristic here, okay, this heuristic is actually a valuable thing. Okay? Because as we'll be talking about in here, we are going to be very, very interested in finding the shortest common superstring of a bunch of strings. Okay? And this one usually does a pretty good job. The fact that it's NP-complete means there is no fast algorithm to guarantee a solution. Given the NP-completeness of the problem, we will settle for this. Any questions about where our knowledge is at this point? Yes? I'm settling for an a am I settling for an incorrect answer? Basically, that's what I'm saying here. What I'm telling you is, part of you should say, oh, I want the shortest common superstring. I tell you that that's your class assignment. Do a cla shortest common superstring. Give me an algorithm for it. One possibility is, you come up with this algorithm. You come up with this bad example. You say, I have failed, and then keep working. And because you have failed and you're ashamed to show me that you have failed, you never come to class again. <laughs> that would be one way of dealing with the problem. Fortunately, we have proven, it has been proven, that shortest common superstring is NP-complete. That means you were doomed to fail when you were looking for a fast algorithm. There is no fast algorithm for solving this problem on all inputs all the time. Okay? Given that, if you want to solve shortest common superstring, you have two choices. One is you kill yourself, okay, because it can't be done. The other is you say, okay, I won't demand the absolute shortest common superstring. Give me a shorter one as you can find while I'm willing to wait, okay? And that now changes your, your you know, you have to relax what you're willing to accept, okay? And now I will settle for an incorrect answer. I'll try to settle for as good an answer as I can. Okay? And that's a perfectly fine thing to do once you've proven that you can't get the best possible answer. Okay? There's no shame at that point. Okay? There's shame at not knowing that you can't get the best possible answer and then saying, well, this is probably good enough. Okay? Any questions about the philosophy, what is shame? What is not shame? Okay? Any questions? I want to make sure that... How, how many people are with me at this point as to wh what, where, where we are? Okay? Specifically my biologist. I'm about to do something that might be a little bit technical, and I don't want to get people dis distracted by it. Okay? So I want people to understand the big picture, okay, before I do something technical. 
Any questions? Okay. Basically, this is a problem. If we show it's NP complete, then the problem doesn't have a fast algorithm, and I know not to look for it. That's the key take home lesson. Any questions? Okay. That said, let me give you an idea as to how you would show that this problem is NP complete. Okay? And I do this every time I teach my class, and every time people are upset and confused. Oh, I got lost. This is too complicated. If you get lost and complicated, don't worry about it. Okay? Is this understood? At this point, for the rest of class, any, I'm going to do technical stuff, sounding stuff. You're free to walk out and ignore it. I will never make you do this. Okay? But I just want to give you an, some ideas to how you prove that there is no efficient algorithm for shortest common superstring. Prove that shortest common superstring is NP complete. Okay? If you've never seen any of this stuff before, it's going to look very complicated. And don't be frightened. I'm not going to make you do it. But if you've seen some of this, you might get some appreciation for how this is done. Okay? Any questions about it? Okay? Fair enough. So let me just go and try to argue with you why there is no fast algorithm for, sh for shortest common superstring. The reason is, I'm going to show that if you could solve shortest common superstring quickly, you could solve a famous problem called directed Hamiltonian path efficiently. Directed Hamiltonian path is NP complete. There's no fast algorithm for it. What I'm going to show you is that if you could solve shortest common superstring fast, you would also be able to find Hamiltonian paths quickly. Okay? And that is ruled out by the fact that the problem is known to be hard. That is going to be my strategy. Okay? Any questions? Okay? So to understand that we have to talk about a ham what is a Hamiltonian path. A Hamiltonian path is a tour that visits every vertex in a network once, okay, without visit, you know, by following edges in the network, okay? So when computer, in here we're going to talk sometimes about things called graphs. To computer scientists, graphs are not like the stock market. Remember stock market graphs, right? Or data graphs. That's what a graph is to many people, statisticians. To a computer scientist, a graph is a system of vertices and edges, okay? Where certain, we have certain vertices and certain pairs of vertices are connected by an edge, like a network, okay? Like a road network, right? You've got a bunch of cities, there's roads between some cities, okay? Any questions what a network is? Yes? No, okay? Any questions about what a network is? This is not so technical. This maybe you should still understand. Any questions? A Hamiltonian path is a Hamiltonian cycle is something that visits every node exactly once, given the constraints of a graph and visiting only the edges. In this graph, there is such a tour. Let's see if I can find one. If I go like this, oops, I'm trapped, right? Does everybody see this? I can't get out of where I am going without visiting another vertex that I haven't been to yet. Does everybody see that? So that's not how I can do it. Is there another way to do it? Let's see if I can do this from memory. Bunk, 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 bunk. Everybody see that? Now I have got managed to visit every vertex exactly once, following edges, and gotten back to where I'm started from. Does everybody see that? We call a tour where I do that, a Hamiltonian um, cycle, where I get back to where I start. We call something a Hamiltonian path if I visit every place, but I don't necessarily get back to where I start. Okay? Any questions about what a Hamiltonian cycle is or path? Okay? 
Any questions about that? The important thing about it is that this problem of given a graph finding what I just did, that problem is known to be NP complete. It's very, very hard, no fast algorithm for it. Okay? That's simply the way the world is built. Any questions about that? Okay? Good. Let's go next page. Bunk. Um, and what's more, it's known to be hard even under a bunch of different assumptions. At the moment, I'm not even going to read what the assumptions are on the slide. Okay? But finding Hamiltonian site paths is hard even when you restrict the graphs to in lots of ways. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay. Now, I am going to prove to you that shortest common superstring is hard. This is the one we care about, right? Given a bunch of strings, prove that, find the shortest string that contains them all, right? How am I going to prove that it's hard? What I am going to do is I am going to take an instance, here's a, the, an input to a Hamiltonian cycle problem, okay? The input to a Hamiltonian cycle problem, remember, was a graph. It had a bunch of vertices and edges. And I am going to take that and translate that into a bunch of strings with the interesting property, the amazing property, that if these strings have a short superstring, this graph has a Hamiltonian path. Okay? Let's think what that would mean. Finding a Hamiltonian path is hard, right? If I could take the input graph and translate it into a bunch of strings such that these strings have a short superstring, okay? If and only if this graph had a Hamiltonian path, finding a short path here, a short superstring here, would be exactly the same as finding the Hamiltonian path, right? Since this is hard to do, if I show you that I could do it, if I could find a fast algorithm for shortest common superstring, that is telling you that there is no way to find the shortest common superstring, okay? So if I told you that you're going to live forever, if you find a pink unicorn in your closet, what does that tell you about what's going to be in your closet? Okay? You're not going to find a pink unicorn there. That's basically kind of the philosophy that we're saying here. Okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to very carefully translate my Hamiltonian path problem into a set of strings such that these strings will have a short superstring if and only if this graph has a Hamiltonian cycle path. Any questions about that? How many people feel they are with me at this point? How many people don't feel they are with me at this point? Okay, any questions if you want to be with me at this point? It's not yet to the point where I really want to blow you away. I'll blow you away in a minute or two. Okay, any questions at this point? Okay, yes? Okay, so the problem on the right is shortest common superstring. That is what we just talked about. The input, what is the problem on the right? Let's look at these things. It's a good question. The problem on the left here is Hamiltonian path. Find a third that visits every vertex in the graph, right? The problem on the right is shortest common superstring. Okay? What? Whether we're going to be able to find a... Sh so, so, shortest common superstring says, I give you as input a set of strings, and I say, find me the shortest possible string that contains them all, right? That's what shortest common superstring is. Hamiltonian path says 
given a graph, find a way to visit all the vertices, okay, such that you visit none of them twice. Isn't that right? And what I'm going to show you is that those two problems are the same thing, right? That's really what I'm trying to do here, is to show you that your problem is the same thing as this known hard problem, right? And do those sound like completely different problems to you, or are there some similarities between them? This is not yet to blow you away. Let's think about this. In what ways are they the same? Someone wants to tell me. What way does Hamiltonian path sound like shortest string, super string? Yeah? Both of them are about visiting every one of the things you're given, right? Isn't that what both problems are about? In Hamiltonian path, you have to visit every vertex, right? Bunk, 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 right? In shortest common superstring, you've got to visit all the strings you're given, right? So on some cosmic level, they, they are not wildly different problems, right? Does everybody agree with that? Is there anything else that about it? Is it just about visiting both of them? Yeah? Uh, we also, if we have the shortest substring, we don't want to visit all vertices twice or more than once. It's about not only visiting things, it's about visiting them in efficient ways, if you think about it, right? It's like if I have, you know, I say I've got to, you know, you've got to visit all these cities, okay? If I have, I'm on a sales trip to visit all these cities, yes, I could go to here. Ka-chunk, ka-chunk, go to here, then come back and go to here again, right? But that's not efficient, okay? The most efficient possible way to visit all those cities is to visit each one once. If I have n cities, how long will my tour be? n, right? It's really asking, is there a very efficient way <coughs> to visit all the cities in the graph? all the vertices in the graph. And likewise, shortest common superstring is asking, is there an efficient way to visit all the substrings? Now, if I say it like that, it totally doesn't sound so incredibly weird that these problems might be the same on some cosmic level. How many people are with me now? Does that make sense? Okay. So then the reduction, the hardness proof, is to show that these problems really are the same. Okay? Any questions? Here I think everyone should still be with me a little bit. Okay? Or if not, I'm happy to answer questions at this point. You should now see that these two seemingly different problems looked at the right way look suspiciously similar. Okay? One of them is hard to solve. If they are the same, the other one's going to be hard to solve. Right? And all I have to do is to push through the notion of looks similar or smells the same to really being the same thing, okay? Any questions here? So let me now show you how I'm going to do that, okay? Any questions? Before, now's where it's going to get technical, so I want to make sure any questions here. We're still on a good level here. Any questions? Okay? Yes? How we can suggest in Hamiltonian path is it's an efficient path, like if we find two paths. Okay, suppose the question is, how, is it, how, do I, how do I express Hamiltonian path as efficient thing? Let's say here it's an efficient thing. You are given a travel budget of N dollars. Okay? You are visiting and you have a country where every railroad link you travel costs one dollar. Can you find a way to visit all N cities within your budget, meaning as efficiently as possible? Right? Now, if you ask me, find a way to visit every city in the network. That's easy, right? I'm just going to go visit here. And I'll go from here. I'm going to go do it any way I want. Visit. 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 Oops. Oh, well. Visit. 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 See? I was not as efficient as I should have been if you looked at what I did, right? If I tried to visit all the cities, it's going to take more than n steps, right? 
Now, if there is a Hamiltonian cycle, well, that's a Hamiltonian path, that's great. Then I'm going to visit every city exactly once, okay, while seeing everybody. That's the most efficient thing you could dream of, okay? So both are about visiting everything. Both are about efficiency, okay? And now they smell the same. I've got to show you that they are the same. Any questions? Any other questions? I'm happy to answer questions at this point before we get into the technical stuff. Any questions? Okay. So how can I show that one problem is in fact the same as the other? Okay, and here I'm going to be very, very clever to do it. Okay. What I am going to do is show you that if you have a network, a Hamiltonian cycle problem, path problem that you want to solve, if it's got, it's, let's say it's got n vertices in it, I am going to construct basically n sets of strings such that the shortest common superstring of it is going to basically read off a Hamiltonian cycle, a Hamiltonian path in that graph. Okay? I'm going to cleverly design these strings so that no matter how you find the shortest common superstring, if you really have it, it will give you a Hamiltonian path in there if one exists. Okay? That's going to be my strategy. Any questions? And now I've got to show you how I'm building my strings. Okay? Let's try this thing. Kaboom. I am going to build my strings in the following way. Okay? First, before I build strings, I need an alphabet. Right? My alphabet is going to have something like 2n plus, let's say, three letters in it. This is my alphabet. For DNA, alphabet was A, B, C, G, T, right? For this proof, my alphabet is going to be um, the numbers 1 through N, the numbers 1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime, dot, 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 N prime. Think of them as being capital numbers and lowercase numbers, okay? When you look at your account, right, your, 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 your typewriter, you can type a capital A and a lowercase a, right? Can you type a capital one and a lowercase one? No. Pretend you can. Okay? It's not any, you know, that's just the way we're going to deal with it, right? So there's going to be the lowercase numbers and the uppercase numbers. Everybody understand that? It's not so frightening. There is also going to be some other weird characters. But what's interesting now is from the lower, each one of these numbers is going to represent the number of a vertex. So my vertices of my graph are numbered from 1 to n. I am now going to construct strings, each of which is three letters long, okay, in the following clever way. If I have a vertex v, okay, if you think about a particular edge that goes from V to X1, okay, Xi, I am going to construct two strings, capital V, X1, um, what you call it, uh, capital V, X1, V, the number of the next edge, okay? What does that mean? Suppose, let's say, that we have, as in this case, a vertex V that has three edges going out of it. Okay? Vertex V can go to vertex 4, 7, or 8. Right? For each one of these edges, I'm going to make two strings. Okay? The first is capital V, 4, capital V. The other is... 4, capital V, the next number, which was 8, 7, right? See where that is? It can go to 4 to 7. The two strings associated with the edge 7 
are going to be capital V, 7, capital V, and 7, capital V, 8. Right? The two strings associated with this are going to be capital 8, V, 8, capital V, 8, capital V, 4, which happens to be the first one again. Okay? Any questions about what we did? Yes? I created it. Okay? I'm doing this translation, right? I'm not going to use the lowercase v's yet. I'll use them later. Good point. Okay? Any questions? Okay? So what's interesting about these strings I created? They may look kind of funny completely. But there's something kind of interesting about them. Can anybody see what's interesting? Yes? I can create a circle of strings. We're no longer talking about a graph, right? We're talking about strings. But notice that each one kind of bites its tail a little bit, right? That if I wanted to build a superstring of them, this next string slides right under it, right? And this next string slides right under that. Does everybody see that? That I could build the shortest possible superstring of these guys, right? They form, and much more, I could connect the tail to the end. Does everybody see that? I get a circle of strings here, right? Each of which overlaps itself by as much as possible, right? So if I want a shortest superstring of these guys, I, I now know how to build it, right? Any questions about it? Okay, those are one set of my strings. What's next? I am also going to build another n strings, each of which is of the form lowercase v pound ca uppercase v, right? So there's lowercase 1 pound uppercase 1, lowercase 2 pound lowercase uppercase 2, dot, 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 up to n. Any questions about that? What is pound? Pound is another weird character here, okay? What can I do to build a, a, a super string of these? Can I, if I just had these n strings, did they overlap at all? If I just had those strings? No, they're sitting here, they're isolated. They, none of them overlap at all with each other, right? If I just say, give me the shortest common super string of these, you've got to concatenate them together, right? That's going to be a big string, right? And finally, I'm giving you two more strings, one of which is a weird symbol, pound v1, lowercase v1. The other is v end pound weird symbol, another weird symbol, OK? Neither of these can be used for much as far as building shortest common superstrings, right? Because they have characters that don't appear in anything else, right? Let me now tell you what the shortest string in this thing is, superstring is, if you've got a Hamiltonian path. What is it going to start with? If you say, I want a Hamiltonian path from vertex V1 to Vn. What is the shortest string going to look like? Well, I claim it's going to start with this, boom, at pound, not V1, okay? It's going to end Vn pound dollar sign, okay? And what is it now going to do? I am going to start trying to build overlap from here. Where can I get, okay, something to overlap from here? Well, remember I have my cycle of strings from before? I had a cycle of strings for V1, 
a cycle of strings for beat two, a cycle of strings for beat three, dot, 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 up to the end. Remember that from before? What kind of a short super string could I be build? Well, if I go to V1 super string and I break it someplace, I can then roll out my circle ending someplace, right? I claim when I do that, if I started with a lowercase v1, I claim that when I break it, it's going to end at an uppercase v, okay? For some other vertex that this is adjacent to. Look back at what the cycle is. You'll see that that's true. Now, I can use one of these connector vertices that goes vi to not vi from upper vertex case VI to lower case VI. See, that's what that is, right? And that now means that I'm going to go from the ending point of one string to another one. And I claim now I can insert another one of these loops. If you give me a Hamiltonian path on the vertices that visits all the vertices once, I claim I can use these connector vertices and break those cycles in a way that the superstring will be very, very short. Okay? In fact, what I claim is 